welcome everyone. Thanks for showing up. Uh, beer to follow, but we hope this is going to be an interesting lead-in to the booth crawl. I'm Ashish Mukherjee. I manage partnerships for Mitakura. I joined my first day at work was actually the first day of the Vancouver Summit. So I know what it is to be new to OpenStack and to have to learn a lot from the firehose. And we're hoping to give you some entertainment and some good concepts of what to do if you're just starting out. Mitakura is an open platform. In the spirit of openness, we are open to hardware and software and services vendors from across the spectrum. And we have several here. Before I introduce them, let me say, we have a bunch of questions that we came up with in advance, but we would love it if you would ask the really tough ones that get some disagreement going. And whatever's on your mind, it's not about hearing our voices, it's about answering your questions so that um, you, know, you can really learn and thrive from OpenStack and not repeat past mistakes from history. And here we have our final panelist. Sorry. Thank you, Rob. Um, it wasn't a subtle way of doing that, sorry. Why don't we lead off with some introductions? Okay, yeah, hi, I'm Rob Esker. Um, I've been working on OpenStack for, I guess, five and a half years or, or maybe a little bit more, whatever, whatever the math works out to within a couple months of the of, uh, inception of the project. Um, I work at NetApp, so uh, I spend all my time on product management strategy, um, but have done work on the uh, architecture and deployment end in the early days, a little bit of development as well. Um, I guess in terms of the community, I'm a co-founder of the Manila Project with uh, Ben Schwarzlander um, and also serve on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors the last couple of years. Uh, my name is Mark Williams. I'm the CTO of Readapt. Readapt is a systems integrator. We help companies typically in the web and tech space fill their data centers full of servers and integrated racks and networking and also help them deploy cloud technologies on top of that. Uh, I've been there for about three years. Prior to that, I was a customer of Redapt and working at Zynga, where I had the good fortune to uh, take Zynga during its good years of exploding into Amazon, consuming a lot of public cloud, and ultimately building a private cloud based on CloudStack. Uh, and I don't know if everybody's following Zynga anymore. No, but it, certainly your Facebook feeds aren't. But now they're completely back in Amazon. So that's, that's a recent development there. Uh, my name is Frank Rigo. I work for SUSE. I manage technology partners um, around several of our ecosystems, including OpenStack. Um, been around the OpenStack um, infrastructure since we released our first product based on Essex. Uh, we have a, if you don't know, SUSE is a Linux distribution company. We have a distribution of OpenStack that we call SUSE OpenStack Cloud. Um, and I blame Mark for a lot of my time wasting if you're related to Zynga. I'm just saying. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Takahiro Kojima. Uh, I work for Fujitsu. Uh, you know Fujitsu? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, actually, a uh, Tokyo based uh, uh, IT company, ICT company. And uh, 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 I am a uh, product manager uh, of Fujitsu OpenStack uh, product. So uh, I have some experience on delivery, uh, OpenStack system delivery to uh, our enterprise customers and uh, you know uh, our public cloud K5. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, give you some uh, stories about uh, struggle, uh, struggling with uh, uh, OpenStack uh, in uh, in such our customer uh, and uh, K5. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I think, can you hear me? I think Takahiro gets the prize for having traveled the farthest um, from Japan. So, and he mentioned struggles. And, you know, I have these questions, and some of them sound sort of negative, but it's not about that. We're all here because we think OpenStack is great, or we think OpenStack at least might be great. The idea, once again, is that We've all made mistakes, we've all seen mistakes. You don't have to make the same mistakes. We want to arm you to make your own mistakes, which are going to be more interesting. So we're going to go through these questions. You ask questions. We love OpenStack. These are tough questions, but that's, it's a reflection on, on our collective struggle. So 
I see about 100 people in the audience right now, a few more coming in. Can we get, by a show of hands, how many of you are operators rather than vendors? OK, a small, maybe a quarter operators. Then how many who admitted it? And how many are actually running OpenStack today as a POC or in production? OK. So there's a lot of you who might run OpenStack in the future, I guess. So there's a lot for the panel to, to let's say, prove. Um, I want to start off with one of, one of my favorite questions, one that wasn't contributed, which was, like, what, what's a great story of something that falls in the category of a, of a disaster? It really was bad, and then, then somehow the ship turned. And maybe there's a lesson in there. Who wants to? Frank, do you want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, you hate to use the word favorite disaster and OpenStack in the same sentence, especially with people that are new. But, um, you know, from, a, from the viewpoint of an OpenStack distribution vendor, um, you, you know, we, we talked to a lot of companies that initially started with getting the bits from upstream, right? So it's an open source product. They can... They can download the bits and start that way, um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of struggles that happen in that sort of a um, you know when, when companies start that way. Not that it's impossible, but it's just very complex. Um, so you know I think we that's probably pretty common that we see that. I think um, another uh, very common thing is um, when uh, the businesses don't get the teams uh, that are integral to the project involved. So the OpenStack project sits in the cloud team, uh, but they haven't integrated the storage team or the network team uh, or the application development team as, as well as they should. Um, we, we had a, um, a project ongoing at a fairly large company uh, that was a proof of concept. Uh, it was going fairly well. Um, and um, several weeks down the road, you know, we get a, we get a call from the company and they say, yeah, things were working great um, in the POC. Everything's working. You know, we're very happy. Uh, except when we moved into production, something happened to Cinder, um, and it just the performance slowed way down, and we're not sure what happened. Um, and we said, well, you know, that's interesting. Is there anything changing between your your POC and your production rollout? And they said, no, nothing. Well, the storage back end changed, uh, but other than that, nothing. <laughs> so. You know, so it was like, well, maybe that had something to do with it, and it turns out that they were different, you know, um, yeah, just different things about the POC storage vendor and the production storage vendor. So the lesson there was, yeah, it's important that you don't do this, you know, as an isolated project from the cloud team and expect it to work right when you roll it on into production when you have to hook in all these other peripheral components. What? Yeah, most of the disasters I see are Two, two, two parts. First is right when you begin talking to the potential prospect for, for OpenStack, you ask them, well, what workloads are you trying to deploy in this private cloud? Uh, or or you'll, you'll say, well, you know, what are you trying to achieve with this? And, and oftentimes I get, well, my boss told me to do this. And there's really nothing more than that. They're trying to have technical credibility by saying we run OpenStack. And there's really no business purpose or workload that, that it's aimed at. And, and when you it's kind of a big red flag for us. We'll stop and say, look, you know, you have to really know this to, to make an informed decision about what architectural decisions are going to make here. The second one is further down the path, once you've collaborated with a customer, they know, you know, directionally where they want to go, they t many customers tend to want to pick all of the fringe features, not necessarily those big tent projects that aren't core, but even within the core projects, which, you know, Cinder and Glance and Neutron and all those, within there, they'll want to make decisions that drag you into the, the weakest features in there, that really stretch the edge, uh, just because they believe they need to integrate with incumbent technology for some reason. And that's, that's where, you know, I've, I've heard ISVs who have OpenStack distribution say, that's like playing with a block box of razor blades. Like, don't do that. And it's very hard to steer uh, that, that initial customer in their first deployment to looking at keeping things simple. 
keeping things simple gets you to that next step of you learn what the behavior of your workloads are on something that's relatively consistent and standard, and then you can now you've learned more about OpenStack, you can take that next step and begin to dabble with some of those newer features. Um, so I don't know if I have a favorite, but I'll maybe I can briefly touch upon two so that I can fit it into the space of one. So um, I guess uh, this is in process, so it looks good. I think it's a success, uh, but uh, not fully complete. Uh, but a large sort of online gaming company, not Zynga, um, who uh, I'm not sure actually is particularly well known, um, is actually an open stack employer and had been since the earliest of days. Um, they, they were bit by a couple things. One, having been amongst the earliest adopters. Uh, and directly from the upstream. So, you know, um, on one hand, they derived benefit very early on. On the other hand, not much was particularly mature at that time. And in particular, um, the <laughs> seemingly pretty obvious uh, uh, problem of, of needing to go from one major release of OpenStack to another was not particularly well solved for. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it's a, a seamless and wonderful experience today, but it's dramatically better now and has has successful, successively improved from one release to the next. So they were bit with having been early adopters, having to, dealt, having to uh, deal with some of the early pain associated with not quite mature, but furthermore, not being able to get off of it. Um, and as, of course, successive releases were re um, uh, made available, uh, the problem got worse. Uh, because it, it was, you know, open stack from uh, two years prior was substantially different and it was essentially a re-platform exercise. It got to the point where actually um, some of the talent that deployed it originally ended up uh, leaving. And so you had a certain amount of institutional expertise that made this thing tick in the first place and then suddenly you were handing this sort of um, what was at that stage an experimental project and handing it off to mere mortals. Um, you know, so what the heck do I do with this thing? Um, and it, you know, that was certainly a failure, uh, or that it was not a failure in in, in the sense that um, it fell over, but they couldn't get off of it. Yeah. Um, the the success portion component of that, I guess, is that, um, and and they didn't start down this path initially. Once this new staff became, or once the the new uh, um, reconstituted admin and operations team was put in place. They started looking at what we'll derive from upstream directly. I think, I think what made it a success is they went with a distribution provider who has thought about and is delivering capabilities that contemplate what it would look like to go from one release to the next and abstract a lot of the complexity, make it deterministic, and, you know, wow, even actually provide a support model for it. So, so it made it consumable. Like I said, that's still in process. Um, but that's uh, maybe two separate things. One, beware the the the, the sharp edge of the uh, of of being on uh, on the cutting edge, and, and two, there I, I think there's something to be said for going with one of the distribution providers. If 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 it makes sense to go with upstream directly and roll your own, then you you probably not in this. Well, I'm not suggesting you're not in this session. I'm saying you probably have the expertise in house to deal with those problems. Wow, just within a few answers, the three of you have touched on essentially every question I had, which is great. It shows we have the right questions, and those are the hot topics. So, I mean, carrying on, I wanted to, oh, we have a question from the audience. Well, why not? Go for it. So a lot of times when I hear about OpenStack um, being deployed, it's a company-wide initiative. Um, but what if you're an app developer? And let's say for whatever reason you need to sprinkle resources in 50 different locations around the world, say about 100 you know, VMs per, per location. Give me a gut check of what kind of investment am I going to need to do? Um, and will it need company-wide initiative in order to get it done? I mean, is it possible for at the app level to, to roll out something like that? Um, or would I need to hire 200 OpenStack engineers or pay somebody $5 million to do it for me? Well, there's several different approaches you can take, but certainly without the governance and partnership with IT, if, if you're the app developer, you're probably not going to get the funding through purchasing and, and that related part of your business. But to the extent that you can go into that partnership, you and, and if there's no expertise of OpenStack in-house, 
you're probably wanting to look at something that's like a managed, dedicated, private hosting approach. Uh, you know, Rackspace or, or similar have places where they can do that. Blue Box is another one. And at that point, you then are shopping for, well, where does that service provider have the locations? If you really need 100 different locations, if that's what you, I can't remember if that's what you said. Cloud gaming. Cloud gaming? OK, yeah, you're going to need lots of little see. points yeah. of presence. So that would be the starter way to go to start quickly and start determining if OpenStack as an IaaS and other platform capabilities provides the automation that you really need. Beyond that, then you know, once perhaps you have some you know, critical mass of a team that can own and operate and, and maintain an OpenStack, you're going to want to very quickly co-architect with either a you know, like a SUSE or, or other commercial provider of an OpenStack that can help you define the physical architecture the, and, and making that consistent in every one. So again, you don't want to create 50 different snowflakes of versions or hardware compositions in that. You, you, you want it as, as normalized as possible. And you want that guidance from that commercial provider to make the right decisions to stay within the boundaries and not get into the bleeding edge features. Then at that point, you can work with like a systems integrator to help you build those consistently and install it consistently from the physical layer. Every version of every component in the server matters. Um, you know, getting all of that, and then successively move towards more independence as you do that. Helpful. So, big investment. It, it's a, yeah. I can't <laughs> give you a dollar figure, but it's probably several hundred thousand dollars, depending and, on. And if your CEO views. IT is a necessary evil, and you'd rather just pay Amazon. <laughs> right, it's going to be a tough sell, right? Right. Well, does it become a competitive differentiator for right. you to have your own technology? For Zynga, it absolutely was at the time that Zynga moved out, started moving out of Amazon. Like there were still growth pains in Amazon. There were lots of significant outages. wasn't the performance that we wanted. All of those things we were able to make better in Zynga's cloud called Z Cloud. And now I'm getting into the next, potentially the next question, but I'll save that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it, it's a substantial investment, and then you're you're still competing with incumbent technology that your IT has, as well as Amazon and other public cloud providers, and that's a hard sell. Thank you. So, staying on the theme of starting with something and then preparing to grow it, I wanted to ask Takahiro from his experience with K5, what what is your experience and your recommendation of starting with a POC, which many in the OpenStack world are doing today. And then how do you, while doing that POC, think forward to production? Uh, what yes. to do? What are the mistakes people make? OK, so, uh, so I, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to uh, explain about my favorite disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, um, my opinion is very similar to the Frank. So uh, uh, that POC is very important. Uh, for open source, so uh, you need to demonstrate uh, uh, you can deliver the value to the customer uh, actually using that open source, open stack. So uh, after that, yeah, uh, as Frank said, uh, yeah, you you uh, will uh, in, uh, encounter many uh, problems uh, when you are moving to the production. Uh, one problem uh, uh, we encountered uh, in K5 testing is that uh, uh, compute service, all compute service, uh, that uh, two, 250 computes are uh, in that uh, in that time at that time are uh, old, uh, go, uh, went down. <laughs> How that happened? So uh, actually, uh, we are uh, configured a parameter in heat uh, to increase the uh, performance of heat. Uh, the worker threats uh, increase the number of threats. Uh, then we encountered, uh, uh, we found a problem in the edge proxy. Uh, you know, HA proxy, and uh, uh, that uh, HA proxy, are, we found the error of uh, maximum connections. So uh, we are uh, configured the kernel of the HA proxy uh, VM and uh, uh, increase the parameter for max connection. Then all computes down. Why? So uh, it's uh, uh, max connections now are maybe are uh, ten tens of thousand, I think. 
So uh, in, uh, in that uh, uh, configuration, uh, all computes uh, try to access to the uh, database or by a uh, conductor. So uh, that means that uh, all computes uh, try to connect to uh, uh, MQ, message queue. So uh, many, many messages are queued in that uh, server. So, uh, so uh, you know, our uh, OpenStack service uh, cannot, be, uh, uh, wor uh, cannot work without MQ. Uh, so uh, all OpenStack API fails. So uh, we are uh, powered up, uh, we are, uh, scale up the uh, messaging queue and uh, wait for several days and et cetera. So uh, what we, uh, we learned from that is that uh, uh, in the large scale system, uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, expect the result of a single configuration change. Even experts cannot uh, detect uh, everything. So uh, you need to test uh, uh, in the scale of your production uh, before uh, applied to the uh, real production. So that is my recommendation. Mark? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, um, so I totally agree that um, establishing at proof of concept stage that indeed there is proof of concept um, is, is critical. Um, but one of the things, and it's actually harkens back to your first question of you know how things can go awry, or, or maybe things that didn't start out so particularly well, or you're great. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of POCs try to lump in every possible shiny object, you know, like emerging technology into one. Um, and you know, apologies if this comes across as common sense, but uh, it, I guess the lesson I've I've taken away is uh, try to start with you know OpenStack alone, and then layer in perhaps your Neutron plugin of choice, or perhaps your Cinder backend of choice, but not necessarily at the same time, and maybe in successive phases. Um, you know, there's a number of emerging technologies that are synonymous in some ways with OpenStack, but not actually part of OpenStack. And while they may be valuable and you may want to incorporate them, it might make sense to evaluate them on a slightly different timeline. Fair enough, although I do think there's some Neutron plugins that just make your installation <laughs> so much easier. I wanted to turn to a, a big picture, but pretty important question as we're discovering which is, you've, you've built this great technology, but what then? Do you, do you build a cloud and hope that the, the developers will come? Is, is it a pull or push model? And how do you evangelize this, what, essentially, technology or platform within the company? And how does the success of OpenStack depend on adoption? I mean, it does depend on the success of adoption, so, so how do you drive that in, in line with the actual install? I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so I've seen it uh, work, and I've seen it fail. I've seen uh, perfectly functional OpenStack clouds not be used, uh, not be consumed. Uh, likewise, I've seen uh, places that were perfect, OpenStack was perfect for, and it just, it, you know, it failed technically. And the point is, is, is um, uh, the places where it seems to stick the most are uh, where there's a tight coupling to the application development community or those, or perhaps actually on a way other end of the spectrum, maybe like a mandate um, that says, hey, and this, this goes to the, the whole open stack as a snowflake. It's, it's hexagonal and frozen, but you know, boy, they sure do look a lot different from one to the next. And you know, that's, you, you've probably heard that, it's certainly not, not original. The, the point is, is um, some come to open stack from a perspective of, I, I want to actually, um, uh, I want to replace or maybe augment or provide a foil to like the incumbent enterprise virtualization vendor or, or, um, and you know, I won't mention who that necessarily is, but the point is, is um, that's a very different set of motivations from those who are trying to build like the cloud, fully cloud native, like next generation buzzword compliant uh, cloud. Uh, the, the application developer coupling is probably more important on the latter spectrum. On the first side of it, it, it works best where there's that corporate mandate to say you will move your existing application base into this particular model. Um, and the place where, it, I guess in particular where it works is if you actually can solve for 
um, the the accounting problem. Um, who actually ends up actually paying for this thing? Uh, if there's actually a mandate that states, you know, there's not just show back, but but actually, you know, charge back. Now, I'm not suggesting that's an easy thing, and OpenStack doesn't solve for it. But but where that's been done well, it seems to succeed overall. So I had this experience uh, in 2011 when, after consuming about 20,000 instances at any given point in Amazon. I built a, a 4,000 node cloud stack cloud, and I couldn't get a first customer to move into it. And exactly what Rob had said, you know, the motivations of developers, I mean, their, their priorities are to, especially in gaming, is to continue to maintain the satisfaction of the users of our games. They don't care about cost until it becomes a mandate, right? So it really took collaborating with senior C-level executives to make sure that cost mattered, and we did have accounting, so we had to make sure that the cost per unit consumed by my month in Amazon versus Zcloud was different, and actually it was a third cheaper to do in Zcloud, but even with that, it took extraordinary effort to collaborate with each partner on the gaming side to actually move them, because again, they, have, they, they had to spend like nine weeks with us to, to migrate that application, because it's got active users on it, and that's very hard. But successfully starting with that first anchor tenant and, and uh, you know, building confidence, getting them to be your evangelists is the key part to success long term. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a ton. I, I agree with, with both of you. I mean, we've had experiences where um, the, the technology is so new and so shiny uh, that people just gravitate toward it. and and. So we, you know, we end up doing some of these POCs where there isn't really an idea of what they want to do, the, the, you know, from an IT perspective or from a line of business perspective. Uh, and more often than not, those don't go very far because you do need to get all the other groups involved um, eventually to make this thing a success. And so the where we've seen the most success is where actually the line of business is driving something or the, um, you know, the application development team is driving a particular goal. Um, and those generally, you know, succeed. So I have several more questions I'd be delighted to ask, but I prefer to get them from the audience. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Alex. Um, I will not mention names or callers or anything, but just I, I work for a, one of the largest telcos in Latin America, and I'm located in Brazil. And uh, we moved to the point beyond uh, the proof of concept. Uh, we, you know, uh, as telcos, we were based, we started doing cloud. Uh, and after a few attempts of doing uh, lots of crazy stuff, uh, we decided, okay, OpenStack is the way to go. And we were supported by the big names in, 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 in the game. Um, and uh, I have a story to share with you guys, is that even within the proof of concept, uh, there are certain things that you cannot uh, prevent or you cannot foresee. Um, and I want to ask you, uh, you guys, for uh, for some thoughts about that. Uh, what do you guys advise us to do? Just to give you a quick example, uh, the whole OpenStack thing might be a buzzword, and and as Frank said, uh, there are some. It's Frank, right? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, there are certain things that even within the the core products uh, that are mature enough to be considered production ready there are some details that made the whole difference and uh, currently what we're doing is, is we, we do have a large uh, uh, storage solution based on OpenStack and uh, we, we did the proof of concept and later on we figured out that we could not measure a, uh, external uh, transferring from, from the internet because our customers, we do private and public cloud and for object storage the way to go is you charge for volume and, and transferring and uh, the solution that we deployed, again I will not mention <laughs> callers or, or names, uh, was based on Ceph and Ceph is not integrated uh, very well with Swift at this point. Uh, I mean it's you can do lots of things but measurement, uh, 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 internet, internet transferring is, you cannot differentiate between what is external and internal. Um, and we, uh, we are now at the point that people at the, you know, uh, uh, the high cleric, I mean, the, the, the top executives that invested in the, the, in the product 
I mean, in, in the technology, they believe it, and they cannot differentiate what is Ceph, what is OpenStack, what is Swift, what is uh, Cisco UCS, and whatever. Uh, they cannot do it, and the only thing that they see is the OpenStack buzzword, and they say, mm, that's not ready. You guys told us. You see, uh, you know, I, I just mentioned Cisco. Cisco is it's pushing OpenStack all over the place. Uh, so now we, uh, I'm a product manager, and I'm, I want to deliver a product that is cost effective, and I cannot do it because the, the top execs are not, uh, they, they didn't bought it. I mean, oh, I can't believe I spent, you know, uh, as I said, I went, uh, we went beyond the proof of concept. We do have many nodes running, uh, uh, and we are not uh, charging our customers uh, because of a very uh, glitch, and um, and the uh, and the expectations are super low now. Meaning they they are they are thinking about getting back to uh, I don't know EMC and doing the way they always did in the past, and just because of very small thing. And how do you guys see the you know the bandwagon, including the largest telcos? Uh, I'm sorry, the larger vendors in in, in, in the arena. Uh, when it comes to these small examples, I have a few of them, but just let's just yeah. stay with this. I, I think you actually have a question kind of built around this, which kind of goes to the point, has OpenStack been oversold in some way? Um, and, you know, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hype curve. You've seen the hype curve from Gartner, right? I mean, there's, this industry is full of hype, right? It was big data a couple of years ago, and um, containers and, and OpenStack. I mean, there's, the technology is awesome, but it's, it's kind of dangerous. You really have to know going into it what it's built for and what it can do and what it can't do. And sometimes that's difficult, right? Especially if you're talking to somebody who's supposed to be an expert and they're telling you one thing, but it, in reality it's something else. I don't know actually what the solution is. These guys maybe, maybe have a better idea. I'm not, I'm not going to claim to have the solution, but I did want to riff a little bit off of what you said. So the hype cycle of innovation for those who are not familiar, Gardner's, you know, attribution to Gardner, um, you know, there's a peak of expectations, so the trough of disillusionment and the slow sort of ramp towards productive use, right? Um, it, it's important to understand with OpenStack that um, you really need to think of each different project as existing in different points on that hype cycle. So uh, something that's very nascent, uh, you know, a newer project, perhaps quote, on the fringe, uh, not necessarily, you know, been around for several releases, is, is going to be quite a bit further behind. Uh, something like Nova, you know, uh, not perfect, but, you know, generally a known quantity uh, at, at this state. Um, and so I guess it's, it's, it comes with a little bit of a, a maturity in having traveled down the path of working with open source projects that you need to develop some organizational confidence about the ability to adopt open in the first place. Um, the extreme end of it, it seems like you, maybe you're encountering some of it. I, there's a pretty, I, I guess I won't mention the name, but a couple of articles that have come out uh, where... The opposite of green. That's the, uh, the only I can yeah, tell you. No, I mean, <laughs> so. and I'm not sure, yeah. So the point is, is um, there, are, there are folks who are in the, in the business of providing the proprietary alternative um, and it, it is often expedient to impugn the open. And it's not that hard to find the warts. Uh, and so unless you've like invested in building the institutional confidence in something that is solid, you might end up burning yourself by riding, getting too close to the leading edge with, with the open thing. You might have burned open in the organization for a while. So I'm not, I don't have the answer, but a few thoughts. No, that's, that's, that's this is where proprietary closed commercial solutions actually have a lot of value. I was a customer of uh, cloud.com, and we basically owned them as an engineering organization to deliver the scale that we needed, and it was huge. Like, we got to 42,000 nodes. You still can't do that with OpenStack, and it's been six, seven years. That's particularly frustrating to me, but it, it kind of goes back to as, as somebody consuming an open product that even might have commercial support for it, you don't have as much leverage on that because it's, it's ultimately tied to the community and the, and the release cadence cycle of OpenStack itself, and it, it's extraordinarily hard. So then it becomes your fiduciary responsibility to focus on, okay, we can only do this. We can't boil the ocean 
to, to completely transform our business. We have to do more iterative consumption of this technology and prove that each point works as we go and expand as we go. That's, that's hard to do. Okay, so we definitely cannot end on a note of proprietary solutions are better. <laughs> so let's take one more question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Raj, and uh, this is my first OpenStack, so bear with me if uh, I sound a little ignorant. So uh, my question is regarding uh, choosing that first project for a POC, and mm -hmm. you know, a lot rides on it because you're kind of building the credibility of OpenStack as a technology that can be used within my organization, right? So if I look at all the use cases and at least the ones that uh, uh, are out there, you know, uh, front and center, uh, what I'm seeing is that most of the use cases have uh, something where uh, the application that's developed is very custom. Uh, it n needs to scale to something like 2,000, 3,000 nodes and things like that. So is OpenStack a viable choice for your traditional, you know, three-tier, I'm running uh, an app on Microsoft SQL Server or uh, Oracle, is OpenStack a viable option to uh, you know, move that kind of workloads into OpenStack, or it, it has to be something very, uh, requires custom uh, development, requires scale in order for it to be successful? And we have just a few minutes left between okay. us. So I'll talk fast. Um, so it absolutely depends on how you uh, uh, compose the cloud. You know, so take something like Nova and, and Cinder and Neutron. They're, part of the power of it is extensibility. There's a lot of different plugs and different options. So I, I guess I contend that you know, the, the capabilities of the cloud you end up with are determined by that which you compose it with. So if you, if you intend to, for example, deliver like high SLA storage with um, you know, a, you know, fully open on commodity gear uh, capability. It's probably not the right fit, um, but it happens that there are you know backends in the storage sense that can provide you know terse quality of service capabilities and, and other differentiated you know storage capabilities that align to those those classic POSIX built applications for which it would be appropriate. I'm not going to suggest it's completely smooth sailing. Um, there are some things that that aren't quite there that aren't fully provided for. But I can definitely tell you, um, just you know, as, as NetApp, um, uh, you know, we have in the three digits of production customers, um, and among them are some of the larger, you know, larger enterprises, you know, largest enterprises, at least a few of whom are actually replacing kind of enterprise virtualization with this, inclusive of all of the applications that they're delivering. It's not without pain, but they see the ROI down, um, you know, down the path. I'll just ask, what business outcome are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to accelerate the ability to affect change and introduce change into this three-tier application, or are you trying to save cost? You know, certainly the former is, is more conducive to what OpenStack will provide for you. If you're really just moving it as is and there's really not much more change going to happen to it, I think you're kind of wasting your time in that particular vector. Um, and I, w I would maybe look for something that's completely net new. And it was covered pretty, pretty well in one of the keynotes this morning. Like, you know, in the, the bimodal, the newer innovation side is, is more akin to what OpenStack and, and even Amazon, for that matter, are, are um, aligned to. Mostly the mode two is where. Mode two, yeah. So we unfortunately are just about out of time because I have 30 more questions to ask. But thank you to our panelists all for joining. And I believe there's beer, but for those who would like to stick around and ask some more detailed questions, we, we're here. Thanks all for coming. <laughs>